Okay, let's uh, let let's start. Okay. Okay, welcome uh, everyone to uh, the keynote lecture by Carola Hamerick, which is uh, part of Virtual Isco's uh, 2021. Uh, this is the Richard J. Estes lecture, uh, which is named for one of the ISCOL's former presidents and a preeminent scholar in the field of international and comparative quality of life research. Um, this, uh, this lecture is part of uh, this series, which focuses on advantage in uh, advances in comparative quality of life theory and research. Uh, we, have honored, uh, we are honored to have Carola Amerik as uh, our speaker for this lecture and she will be introduced and the session will be moderated by Ming Cheng. Uh, Ming Cheng, the platform is yours. Good, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Kalola Omorish uh, to uh, all of you. Uh, uh, Kalola uh, is a associate professor at the Department of Sociology, Faculty of Human Sciences, uh, Sofia University uh, in uh, Tokyo. Uh, actually, he has been uh, working uh, in, uh, in, in the University of Hokkaido uh, before uh, she uh, moved to, to Tokyo. Uh, also, quite before that, she, is a, she was a senior research fellow at the uh, German Institute of Japanese uh, study, also in Tokyo. Uh, she had a PhD degree from uh, sociology department uh, in the uh, University of Cologne, uh, Germany. Uh, her current research focus on subjective well-being and social inequality, especially on the, the interrelationship uh, of experiences of precariousness, status, anxiety and the feeling of belonging, feeling of belonging. Uh, she recently published uh, uh, some uh, very interesting books, uh, including Social Change in Japan, uh, published in, in Lulish, as well as Social Inequality in post growth uh, Japan. Also, uh, she has uh, numerous articles uh, uh, working on uh, the subject of uh, happiness and well-being, uh, including a recent one uh, in a journal of happiness study. Uh, the title is Analyzing the Relationship Between Social Capital and the Subjective Well-being, the Mediating Role of Social Affiliation. Uh, I'd like to remind uh, all of you that this uh, uh, lecture uh, is named uh, Richard S.T. Lecture. Uh, uh, Richard XT is our former uh, president of uh, ISCO. Uh, he has been uh, uh, supporting uh, the society and uh, helping uh, to promote the study of uh, well-being. Uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, very happy that uh, this uh, uh, lecture uh, has been uh, continuing uh, inviting uh, famous and uh, successful scholars uh, in this field. And, and this year, uh, it is uh, Carola uh, Omorish uh, uh, that uh, we we, uh, we we have such an honor to invite her uh, for this uh, lecture. And uh, now I'd like you to, to uh, give this time to uh, Professor uh, Omorish and uh, uh, probably a one uh, fifteen minutes or or so, and then up. Towards, we would uh, open uh, to the audience uh, for Q and A. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, uh, Professor uh, Omarish. Thank you, Ming Chang. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, and of course, overall, thank you very much for the invitation. I will talk whilst I share my slides because that usually takes some time. Oh no, no surprisingly fast. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm pretty sure that I am the lecturer that everybody thought, who's she? <laughs> I've never heard her name. So I will also start with a short introduction. I'm very honored to be invited for this and I must say I was actually very surprised. Um, 
to be asked to do this. Um, yeah, like I, as I thought, oh, there's more prominent members of this community who would have maybe fit better, but I will try my very best to um, introduce my research and hopefully entertain you for the next hour, um, et cetera. So my, the title of my talk is The Fear of Not Being Ordinary. And I will be, <clears throat> well, it's a, the, the focus of the, my lecture is actually not so much on, an, on internationally comparative research, but I focus very much on Japan, um, where some references to comparative uh, research that I've done, but it's not the main focus today. So um, before I start, however, let me start with a quick self-introduction because, well, already uh, Min Chang kindly introduced my, my CV. So just as a bit of a background, I'm born, raised, and mainly educated in Germany. So I'm originally from Germany um, and my PhD is also from, from Germany, but I've been in Japan um, continuously since, since 2008. And I also studied a little bit of Japanese studies. So I have kind of a mixture of um, sociology plus area studies, if you will. Um, and um, studying something complex as well-being, especially subjective well-being um, in a society that you're an outsider to can maybe be an asset. I sometimes think that maybe it can be helpful to see things that others might miss, but it also means there's a lot of things that are really hard to get behind and understand. And I will try and kind of share my journey of doing this in this talk today. So my research interests are various, but they all come back to an inclusion of subjective um, indicators into sociological research. So I've been interested in the interrelation of objective and subjective well-being. So I guess that fits well here. Uh, also determinants of status identification. So what uh, determines where people place themselves in society. Social inequality in S3B uh, is um, a big part of what I've been working on, especially how the perception of social inequality and also status anxiety, experiences of precariousness, how they all impact on su subjective well being. And that's something I'll be um, talking about today. And all of this with a social gradient. So within um, yeah, social structures, let's say. And social capital, how does that impact and how can that maybe buffer some of the impact of social inequality? And lastly, that's a topic that I've been, not only recently, but it's kind of an ongoing struggle <laughs> to understand what, what shapes uh, well-being, subjective well-being in an East Asian country like Japan. And this, yeah, this is something I still struggle with. Um, and I close my talk today by focusing on this as well. So let's, let me move on. It's always unfortunate that in these kind of settings, I can't see the audience. So I have no clue what everybody's thinking or doing, but I'll just go on. So outline of my talk. First, I think in order to understand um, what's happening with subjective well-being or well-being in Japan, it is probably important to understand the development of post-war Japan. So I will give a quick, uh, short recap of how societal model in Japan has changed first towards that of a mass middle-class society and then moved on um, rather abruptly, I should say, to that of a gap society, because I feel that is one of the, the very decisive factors behind um, what yeah, mechanisms or processes we are witnessing regarding well-being in Japan. Um, and I will <clears throat> talk about this in the second section where I talk about the relevance of the societal model for individual well-being, um, status anxiety and precarity, how we might have a mismatch for some parts at least of the population between objective and subjective well-being. Then I will also introduce this concept of social affiliation um, what, and what that means for individual well-being in the specific context of Japan and that kind of leads me to the last section where I want to talk about interdependent happiness, um, the concept itself and also its determinants. And now I'll just give a quick disclaimer about how I will talk today because I prepared this not so much like the usual research presentation, but I will focus more on telling a story today. I thought like, okay, I have an hour, it's super rare. <laughs> Usually you have like 15, 20 minutes. So I will rather tell a story than bombard you with data, but I will actually bombard you with some data towards the end. Um, I will reference mostly my own, I'm sorry, but I'll use this platform to blatantly self-advertise. 
my own empirical research, but I will not go to, like do this in the um, traditional style of introducing it in all detail and showing all the models, etc. but really reporting mainly the results so that I can introduce different things. Um, and maybe hopefully it, some things sound interesting enough so that you will then look up the actual article or publication on this. And, and I will want to finish with puzzles and open questions because there are so many for me. There's still so much that I don't quite understand or know how to interpret it, etc. So I'm really hoping for input in the discussion because I think we are all interested in moving towards or understanding, finding appropriate practical, but also practic practical measurements of quality of life. And that can be objective as well as subjective, et cetera. And here, the main focus is probably on what, how cultural context should or could play into this. Okay, before I do the recap of social change in Japan, maybe just a quick introduction to quality of life and individual well being in Japan. I had no clue what kind of audience I would be talking to. And my feeling is that hopefully there's some, at least some listeners in the audience that know nothing of Japan, at least nothing that goes beyond common knowledge. So, for, and then probably the common knowledge would be okay, Japan is a highly affluent, highly developed nation. And um, in terms of quality of life, at least objective quality of life, it should, it's really high up there. And it's true if we take, for example, just one indicator, we know that there are so many different ones and much more detailed ones than the Human Development Index nowadays. But here, Japan ranked, for example, 19 out of 189 countries in 2020 as still one of the highest life expectancies in the world. Um, high levels of educational achievement, high per capita income, we all know that that's not really enough to judge the quality of a society. But if we only look at these indicators, then Japan is doing very, very well. But it's not actually on the top, among the top runners in the more holistic evaluations of societies, especially when subjective indicators are added. So OECD's Better Life Index, for example, if you like just use all the indicators weight, weighted, weighing in the same way, then Japan in 2021 is number 25 of, out of 40. So amongst a community of countries that should have kind of similar development levels. And in the World Happiness Report, um, it's only number 56 out of 149. And of course, the World Happiness Report is very subjectively based. So we can see that the objective um, quality of life should be very high, but we don't see this reflected in the, um, in the subjective evaluation of the people who live in Japan, at least on average. Of course, there's a lot more to this. So why is that the case? And I think to understand this, um, we need to look into Japan's development a little bit. There's actually not, not a lot reliable long-term data on subjective well-being in Japan. That this is, so there's for a very short time, <laughs> Japan also had a commission on measuring well-being by the government, which was quickly uh, kind of de-established again, unfortunately, but they, uh, whilst they were in office, let's say, um, they made this chart um, uh, showing us the development of happiness and life satisfaction. So that's kind of data that was available and GDP per capita. And we can see the rather common trend of GDP goes up, but um, happiness, life satisfaction stays the same, but actually life satisfaction even drops in the early 1990s and then it kind of recovers, but you can also see that there's a lot of gaps in the data here. So it's really difficult to show this one wonderful uh, line that tells us how it developed, but I will give you, I will mainly explain what happened in this time period and to get a better understanding also of what happens afterwards. So I will try and do this now. So social change in post-war Japan from mass middle class to gap society. And here I use some pictures from two movies that kind of romanticize this era of uh, Japan in 1950s and 60s from the defeated nation and then quickly moving into rapid economic growth. And of course, probably life wasn't as lovely as it looks in these movies, but it's a bit romanticized nowadays, but I'll give you some background. So what happened? So 19, in the 1960s, so Japan of course is one of the um, kind of comes out defeated after the second world war and needs to regain self-confidence and one way of doing this is investing in economic growth 
So rapid economic growth and quickly Japan advances to the second largest economy. And this comes with a general upward shift in income and standard of living for everybody, if you will. Um, during this time, there's the introduction of long-term employment, lifetime employment, seniority-based wages. So you work at your, for your whole life at the same company and your income goes up steadily. So it's super safe, if you will. Um, also, also introduction of an old age pension system, medical insurance for, for employees, so also welfare state development at the same time, uh, rapid educational expansion, and overall the occupational structure shifts from agriculture to blue and white collar jobs, which also comes with large scale migration from urban to rural areas. No, rural to urban areas, what happened here? Of course, it's the other way around. So from the countryside into the cities, and this means that former class distinctions are blurred. And um, very quickly, this emergence, uh, uh, the, the self-perception uh, of a homogeneous middle-class society comes about. So every, pretty much everybody feels their middle-class. But let's look at Japan's social structure. I'll also show the second half later. So I'm just showing the, you what happened here in terms of, uh, this is the EGP class scheme, so I'm based on occupations. Um, we can see that from the 1950s until the 1980s, there's a really um, fundamental change in the occupational structure, especially farming class really drops and we have a, a big, um, uh, the, the, the professional managerial class is, is growing, so big shift from blue color also to white color. And in general, it means general social upgrading. So this is what's happening, but it's a very short period of time in which this is happening. So this is really, a lot is going on in society at that time. And this also is reflected in where people place themselves in society. So this is status identification. Again, I'm covering the part that I will show later. So where do people place themselves? In the upper, upper, middle, middle, lower, middle, or lower. So it's not the best classification. It's the one that the government uses, but it's actually not so different if you use classifications that uh, rely less on middle categories. But what we can see is that People who place themselves in the lower category, kind they, they um, become fewer and fewer. And we have by the mid 1970s, over 95% or so place themselves in, in one of the middle categories. So the upper class is actually not growing, but middle is the important part. And this also is very much discussed in published public discourse, like we're all middle of the 100 million general middle class society. So everybody's the same and everybody has enough. That's kind of the, the idea behind this. And then we move on again, I'm using some movie posters. So in case you're interested, maybe you can find these and watch them. So from the 1980s to 2015, uh, there we again have big changes. But first of all, the 1980s is still kind of the glorious time of Japan, like Japan is number one or Japan as kind of the new economic power that seems to be threatening the Western economies because it has matured and now is also able to develop own technologies. Like here, this is a movie about how Japan managed to win the war in developing VHS tape and, and like, kind of like, war, like uh, economic war, I should say. But so, moving forward as an immature economy but then it shifts into an era of gap society which here this is a story about poverty and neglect and something like that but let me explain in a bit more detail so first of all the golden years i i call them here the 1980s so highly affluent highly educated japan has become a leader in technological development it's also a often named as prime example of relatively equitable economic growth. So this is distributed relatively equally throughout society. And it's the first non-Western success case. So the World Bank, for example, lauded Japan as spearheading the East, economic, East Asian economic miracles. So it's kind of the leader of the pack there. Um, but then the economic bubble of the late 1980s uh, bursts in the early 1990s, and that means a lot of change. And this is the start to the so-called lost decades. The first, it was only the lost decade, the 1990s, and then the 2000s didn't get better, so it became <laughs> turned into lost decades, and then I did dot, 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 because it's not really as if so much has changed. So abrupt economic downturn, and that later leads to 
a long period of uh, not really recession, but maybe economic stagnation, but it's perceived as recession after so much economic growth, then unemployment becomes an actual possibility even for regular workers. It's still very, very low, around 5% or even less in Japan. So in international comparison, it's kind of ridiculous to even mention this, but if it was never there, like never even possible to use, lose your job as a regular employee before, then this can be quite threatening. I have a, a chart for this later as well. Then we have the so-called ice age of no hires for young entrants to the labor market. So in the uh, just after the bubble burst, there were like a few years where it was relatively difficult for young people to find stable employment. Um, and the strategy of then the, the government tried to recover and grow, go return to economic growth by deregulating the labor market. And this has led to a dramatic shift in the quality and also safety of employment and also to an increase in income inequality because it has caused a stark increase in non-regular employment. So dualization of the labor market, we had uh, in 15% of workers worked in non-regular, and that's often very precarious employment in the Japanese case in the mid-1980s, and now it's close to 40%. So it has really increased. Um, like I said, there was kind of the hope that this will go away and Japan could return to economic growth, but then Lehman shock in 2007 hits and it's clear we're not really returning easily to economic growth. And actually this also, um, this hit mostly the employments who were non-regular employees and were easily fired. And this also uncovered insufficiencies of the very company-based welfare system of Japan's with a rel relatively weak welfare state. Uh, and there were a lot of, or it's still the number of households that need livelihood assistance is gradually increasing. Aging also plays a role, but I won't go into that so much now. And there were like buzzwords in the early mid 2000s, working poor Japan's new underclass. And for a lot of people, this has had become a reality, but for still a larger part of the society, it was not the re reality, but it's kind of a scary possibility that you might lose everything very suddenly. So growing awareness of economic inequality and poverty and um, gradually by the late 2000s and today, the, the understanding that Japan is not as equal and actually there is inequality and the possibility also of drop like social downgrading, let's say. However, when we look at Japan's social structure, so here before, this is the chart I showed you up until 1985 just now, and you can see if we move, as we move on until 2015, it's the latest data we have for this, um, you can see that actually the social structure has somewhat stabilized, like we see some increase in the, the kind of skill manual, like low, lower occupational categories, but overall comparing to the post-war years, this has become more stable, but Behind this, a lot of stuff is happening. So occupational structure might be similar, but as I said, the quality of that employment can differ very much. Um, maybe just this, I already said, employ employees by employment status, labor market segmentation with here the red bars are the, the, the red ones is the non-regular staff. And you can see like from around 15% in the mid 1980s, up until around 40% today. So it's a really big increase in this. Um, yeah, and it and kind of, uh, yeah, we have a, a gap between these regular and non regular employees. And the unemployment rate, just for information, because like I said, you can see that up until the 70s, so first in the very post war years, it was higher. And then it, um, there was nearly full employment, let's say, like as you can see, unemployment rate, a total of below 2%, that's like a dream come true. But then the bubble burst, and here you can see how it really goes up for the 20 to 24 year olds up to 10%, but it also drops again. So today, again, unemployment isn't really the biggest problem in Japan, but this going up once, going down again, uh, it has kind of uh, caused also awareness of that that's something that could happen. So and losing your job is actually a possibility. So I'm, that's why I'm put, I put this in here. And um, also by the late 2000s, so around 2008, when the OECD published 
um, comparison of levels of income inequality and relative poverty, um, as you can see here, there was kind of the outside perspective suddenly telling Japan, hey, you're actually not as equal as we always thought, and poverty seems to be a problem. And we can see here that Japan is here, and OECD average would be here. The Gini coefficient is the blue bar, and Japan's Gini coefficient at that time is slightly above OECD average, still much lower than for, for example, the US or Turkey, Mexico are always much higher but it's not as low as you would expect from the common image of Japan as being so unbelievably equal. And similarly, poverty rates also much higher than would be expected. So it becomes clear that Japan uh, is not and probably never was as equal as the common image was also amongst the population. Um, there's also change for regular workers, so the, of course there are large portions of the population who stay in regular employment, but also for them, whereas average wages had gone up and up and up until the early and even mid 1990s, then they drop in the aftermath of this burst economic bubble, and then they stagnate. So this all impacts on how people feel in society and how, feel, how secure they might feel, and of course how happy and or satisfied they are with their lives. So overall, the perceived societal model has uh, shifted over this time. So this is ISSP data, 1999, 2009, and 2019. And here you can see that the change, what is perceived as the dominant model, so these are the different types of society that respondents of the ISSP can choose from, that they think, like, what is your society closest to? What does it look, is, yeah, what is it closest to? And in, in 19, uh, 1999, so that's just after the bubble burst, there was still a relatively large share of, res of respondents claiming that Japan is this type D, middle mass middle class society. But you can see how that has dropped dramatically, it kind of recovered a little bit, but overall it has dropped. And on, uh, on the other hand, more unequal um, society uh, structures structures like social structures have become seen as like this is what Japan looks like to today most of all the type B with only few people at the top and more people at the bottom but also type C but you can see clear shift in how Japan is perceived by uh, the Japanese let's say what's the impact on status identification none it seems so you can see that Still, I mean, you have not many categories uh, except for the middle to choose from, but there's still, it's, it's not as if we see a big increase of people placing themselves in the lower class. So we still have a very strong idea of being middle class. And this actually is also not different if we use different status identification classifications. So here we have uh, upper middle, lower middle, and then upper, lower, lower, lower. But you can see that also here, there's not much going on here, it seems. But actually, there's a lot more behind this. I will go through this very quickly. Maybe I have to skip a little bit, but I just want to explain this black box middle class because it looks as if nothing has changed, but it has. So this is from a project that I'm a member of where we have um, collected data to understand the determinants of status identification in Japan. So these are, it's a very simple, simple setup that I'll be using here, but so to, to what extent do these factors impact on where people place themselves in society? So especially interesting here, of course, education, occupation, income. And overall, so we have now all like different data sets in which we look at this over time since the 1970s up until 2015. And objective social status has actually become a better predictor of status identification over the years. So in the 1980s, when everybody had shifted up um, rather quickly, it seems that there's been kind of a blurred idea of where you are. Like there's not much connection between actual objective social status and where people place themselves. However, by the 2015s, uh, to, no, that's not a word, 2010s, um, the explained variance here of status identification has grown. And we can see that it's a more realistic understanding that people have today of where they are. This has been called the quiet transformation of status identification. So it seems as if nothing has changed, but actually the relationship between the determinants of status identification and status identification that has changed. 
So it means that we have a more realistic understanding of social status in Japan today than in the 1980s. Okay, now let me, so summing this up, we have this first half of post-war period until now, so up until the 1980s, kind of elevator effect, general upward mobility, it's kind of a state of illusionary leveling because Japan probably never was as equal as was often claimed. Um, but everybody felt that we're all the same. We're, we're all middle class. And then um, while here, the social structure in terms of occupational structure has stabilized. I also showed that on the behind this, there's a lot of shift in terms of um, how, how um, safe and stable people can feel in their employment. So there's a lot of uh, changes to the quality of employment. And um, with growing income inequality, people also realize this Japan probably never was as equal or that, that realization is probably not there, but Japan is not as equal as we thought. And this we call state of disillusioned dis inequality. So ah, no, now we are a gap society. And I showed this at the same time, um, so I showed before, perceived model has clearly changed to that of a more unequal society, uh, social structure, but the desired societal model is still the same. Here we have, again, ISSP data and people still, well, 50%, around 50% still want the type D, which is an idealization, I think, of this all middle class society era. And it clearly is a mismatch of reality and ideals. So I think that's important to remember when thinking about how people feel within Japanese society today. So some advertisement, if you want to read more about this, I have these two books that you can look at. I only edited them. So of course it contains research of many um, yeah, wonderful researchers. So please pick them up or just get in touch in case you're interested to know more about these. Then two more additional developments that are very important to understanding Japan, but I can't cover them because then I won't have time left, is first of all, the rapid demographic aging. Japan changed from a very young society in the 1980s to the oldest now. So it's, it's aged very fast and we know other nations are following. And also a weakening of social bonds in family work, local community. So the kind of network that people can fall back on in, in times of need. So if I talked about how people might feel more insecure about income and employment, also the network, family network, or uh, also local community or work, et cetera, it's all weekend. So there's not really much to fall back on, or less, I should say, than used to be. Okay, now I will move to the second part, relevance of the societal model that I now explained. So this movement from middle class to gap, Society for Individual Wellbeing, and I'll be talking about status anxiety and experiences of precariousness, precarity, and social affiliation. So now, um, I mean, now it's already some 20 years that we have these new or even more new insecurities, but what has happened, I think, is that we've seen a dismantling of the robust protective cocoon. I do like this a term used by Giddens of institutional embeddedness, which was formerly provided by family, local community, and in Japan, very much the company, kind of the company as family that kind of covers everything. Um, also, the social security net um, offered by the welfare state is not sufficient. That has become very clear, even though some there have been some changes. Family bonds have weakened, so who do you rely on in times of need? For example, um, if parents are retired, they might also not have enough money anymore to support their um, adult children or like these kinds of things. As a result, so there's a lot more I could say here, but I should not because I'll run out of time. What, but what's the result? So the result is feelings of vulnerability and socioeconomic precariousness that, uh, that spread across all social strata. And this is something where I'll try and also uh, in a second show some of my research. So we have increasing worries and anxiety. So this is government data. Again, they ask a question every year, do you experience worry and anxiety uh, in your everyday life? And then people can say yes or no. So it's very straightforward, but they do ask a bit more about what people worry about. But you can see that um, 
from the early 1990s, so after the burst of the bubble, it really goes up. At the same time, this is also connected to demographic aging because the share of elderly people is growing and they often worry about their health, but it's not only this. So it's also a growth in people who worry about income and um, yeah, securing their livelihood. So this is, this is really part of this. And at the same time, Japan has also seen an increase in cases of clinical depression um, and also an increase in suicides, especially also among younger age groups. So this is also something that is changing. Now, um, maybe to understand this insecurity. So I, I mean, I think now, now it might sound as if everybody in Japan is poor and it's so terrible. Of course, that's not the case. Quality of standard of living is still um, comparatively high, there are parts of the society that are um, in relative poverty, etc. But it's not really that terrible. But the perception is off. And I, that's something I'd like to show here. This is data from 2009 from a nationwide survey that I carried out when I was at the German Institute for Japanese Studies. Um, so at that time, there's a, I think it hasn't changed that much in the past 10 years. But there's a very vague idea of what poverty means. So here, this is data of people who were asked whether they felt they were poor, and then they could say yes, or I grouped it yes or rather yes, no or rather no. And I cross it here with where people place themselves in the, so in the social structure. So what's, uh, people, do they feel as upper class or as upper middle, lower middle, et cetera. I have not part of society because this was about feeling excluded. But the interesting point here is that more of more than half of the people who thought of themselves as poor, which is 42% as a reference, the actual relative poverty rate at that time was 16%. It was actually published for the first time ever in 2009. It's also quite unbelievable, at least from a maybe European point of view, I should be careful. But um, so more than half of these self-assigned poor place themselves in the middle class. So that makes very clear that there's not a real understanding of what poverty could be. And, um, but this, this insecurity of, I might, I might have less than probably my reference group. So this is probably that plays, something that plays into this, but we see a lot of insecurity, I think here. So precariousness, this is this, what I want to call this type of insecurity as a social category. So precariousness, precarity, there's discussions about how you should term it, but mainly what this is about, it's a living situation that is characterized by uncertainty. And um, this is not necessarily restricted to the lower strata of society. Of course, it's more prevalent there, but with the, in Japan, for example, with the increasing discontinuity of employment over the life course, so you used to be used to having, joining a company and then you will just stay, but that's not, the reality anymore for a growing share of, of workers. Um, there's the fears of not being able to sustain current standard of living um, are not restricted anymore to the social periphery. So it's not anymore only people at the lower end of the stratification um, ladder, but they have also reached the middle strata. And this is something I looked at. So Bourdieu has termed this much earlier, precarity is every day, not everywhere nowadays, like also, also talking about this idea of new insecurities uh, and that experiences of this precarity cut across vertical categories of strata and class. The idea there was that we need to move away from this strictly vertical uh, classification. That's not so much what I'm after here, but this precarity I think is interesting, especially when you talk about well-being. And I think we can say that it's everywhere also in Japan. So here I use, um, you don't have to read the whole thing here. It's just um, the data that I use for what I will show you in a second. So status anxiety and isolation fears is something I will talk about now. And I will explain in a second also how, what is, how that's measured here. They do cut across social strata. It's something I wrote about in, uh, in the chapter actually of one of the books the gap as threat, status anxiety in the middle. And the data for this comes from a survey from 2019. It's actually an online survey, but it's very, very good. And also uh, it's a random sample. Um, it's good data. Let's say quickly that I shouldn't lose time on this. 
I'll show you the what I what the analysis. So first of all, how are uh, this is I'm only showing the descriptive part and I'm just summing up the multivariate analysis of so of course I'm doing more in the actual article than just showing descriptives but I think it gives it a good impression of what I'm trying to say. So here we see um, the distribution of financial anxiety. So people were asked, thinking five years ahead, I worry about my own and my family's livelihood. This is financial anxieties. And then isolation fears. Isolation fears is actually what I later talk about, kind of the opposite of social affiliation. So it might be a bit confusing, but I've been struggling a little with finding the right term for this. So here, isolation fears is measured as I worry that society leaves me behind. So this is very broad and it's not, um, I fear that I, my neighborhood or my family leaves me behind or not social isolation in that sense, but society. So it's very broad. So being left behind by society, not fully belonging to the social whole, maybe not being able to contribute in this, in, in, a, in a meaningful way. And here, this is um, the dis just the simple distribution of these um, uh, questions where I just made, turned them into uh, like cutting at the middle and then so worry or not worry or rather worry. Um, yeah, no, I worry or rather worry as percentages. So because it's then easiest to see and then crossed with where people place themselves in society. And we can see isolate, um, financial anxieties are very high throughout all of these strata. I mean, this is subjectively placed, but nevertheless, in the lowest, people who place themselves at the bottom of the um, social ladder had the strongest or the highest share had financial anxiety. But even people who said, I'm placed myself at the top, they also had 62% of them were not sure whether they would be able to keep this. So this is not just something that happens at the bottom. And isolation fears, like this feeling of I'm worried of being left behind, it's also stronger uh, towards the lower end of this ladder, but it's also there. So even in the upper class it might mean something different, but um, we do have it. So that's the imp one point I want to make. So first of all, this cuts across all of these strata, but with the social gradient, it's stronger at the bottom, but it's not uh, but it's also there at the mid in the middle and at the top. And um, what determines these uncertainties? So here I just sum up what the it's just a regression models, nothing fancy, but here I looked at the determinants. And first of all, uh, so these experiences of precarity on the one hand, the financial anxieties and the social isolation, they were actually only weakly determined by differences in socioeconomic status. So gender, age, marital status, education, employment status, income, the last three ones are the most important here, I think. They were really didn't explain that much. But when you then added uh, past experiences of social downgrading, so subjective, uh, people were asked, like, do you feel that your um, standard of living has changed? Yeah, it's reduced or it's the same or it gone, went up. So people who felt that they had had to reduce in some way, and that was a large share. They also had um, stronger, of course, financial anxieties, but also these isolation fears or fears of being left behind by society. And then I added the mere perception of social inequality as a social problem. So not the personal effectiveness, but just like, do I think uh, social inequality in Japan is too large? That's the item. And this also had um, a clear uh, effect it also induced anxieties about one's own livelihood and position in society, irrespective of socioeconomic status or past experiences of status change. So this new model of Japan as gap society really made people insecure. Not, I mean, it, now it's been a few years, so it might have changed a little bit. So it'd be interesting to do this again, but it's not that long ago so that we did this. So these are determinants of these uncertainties. Okay, now, of course, I assume that most people here work on subjective aspects of well being. So I also checked how this um, uh, impacts on subjective well being. So these are uh, measured here, very um, yeah, kind of standard subjective well being overall. Um, I'm satisfied with my life as it is, et cetera. And this is now a very 
simple um, summary of a comparison of data from Germany and Japan, where we used a relatively complex model to check how subjective well-being is impacted not only by sociodemographics, and so this was carried out with a psychologist, um, uh, Lantamann, and a sociologist, uh, Bude, in Ger from Germany. So they also wanted in to include coping resources, and we have different types of trust, but let's ignore these for now and focus more on this. So subjective well-being, how is that impacted by um, status anxiety in terms of like be worrying about losing your income, etc., and isolation fears. So this be being left behind by society. I'll talk a bit more about also the measurement for this. And the idea was that status anxiety probably induces these fears and that then uh, reduces subjective well-being. But at the same time, status anxiety should also have a direct effect. And we do find this for both Germany and Japan. But there is a difference. And the difference is that there's a strong negative impact of these isolation fears on subjective well-being in Japan. But there was nearly no impact in Germany. So in Germany, the direct path was much stronger, but this not so much, so it wasn't so important. So this is really, um, it, it seemed to be specific of specific relevance in the Japanese context. And that I found this very interesting. And so I kind of stuck with this idea of what is this belonging to society and why does that seem to be important? So maybe first I should explain this feeling as part of society. So in the earlier days, let's say of my, well, my career is not that long, but when I started to use this uh, concept of social isolation, um, I realized that it seemed to be difficult to grasp. So I played around with different terms and I ended up with social affiliation. What is it? So it's based on a German concept, which is actually, so it's developed by the two cooperation partners I had in Germany at the time. They developed a concept called subjective exclusion in German. Um, but it was very clear to me soon that using this in English and also in Japanese confused um, researchers who worked on other concepts of exclusion, social exclusion. So I kind of moved away from this term. But it is about feelings of connect, being connected to the social whole, an individual's subjective importance for society, perceived ability to keep up with society, and feeling of being like a valued member of society. And it is actually measured, however, negatively, because originally it was this subjective exclusion. So it's measured in terms of feelings of disconnectedness and marginalization. So I'll show you the original scale developed in Germany that we then translated into Japanese, and now I've also um, used it in the US once in English. So the original six item scale was, I'm worried that society leaves me behind and society doesn't care about me. I feel like I don't really belong to society. I don't see a place in society in which I'm being taken seriously. I feel that nobody needs me, needs me and I feel excluded from society. And so we used this in Japan, it turned out that not all items work really, really well. So Moving on, um, using this in other um, surveys, I actually mainly used the three items highlighted here because they seem they had the highest predictive power in the Japanese context, and some didn't really work well. It's maybe also a question of how you can say and word things in the Japanese language. Then I did um, tested this so social affiliation as predictor of as uh, of subjective well-being. I'm Summary, I will summarize the main uh, findings for this. So this is from an article in the Journal of Happiness Studies where we looked at uh, the relationship between, well, social capital and subjective well-being. It's like well-established link. We all know that this uh, is important, but we tried to, here it's together with Tim Tiefenbach, a former colleague of mine at the German Institute. Um, and we looked at social affiliation as an, a different type of social capital, let's say, and how that maybe filters social capital, other forms of social capital, and how that then impacts subjective well being. And the main findings, oh, I'm sorry, this is a bit out of order here. So, main findings are social affiliation is just as important for subjective well being as other resources of more, like, let's say, traditional resources of social capital, like trust, networks, and norms. 
and it was actually um, the total effect of social affiliation, this belonging to society was actually slightly bigger than the total effect of social capital. So this really had an, was an important uh, predictor of subjective well-being. So this is data only for Japan. And uh, interestingly, the effect of social affiliation was also bigger than the total effect of income. So really important, it seems, in the, that, uh, in the social context, it's more important than uh, the social context of being part of society seem to be more important than material affluence might be saying a bit too much, at least in Japan. But clearly there is something that makes this important. Okay. Now, open questions remain. So why is it now that um, this social affiliation, that being able to feel as part of the social whole, so this doesn't mean I feel part of, I have family and friends and like a tangible social network, but overall, so it's very broad. So why, is that, why does that seem to be so important for individual happiness? And maybe from a Western, more individual focused point of view, I mean, that's what, where I grew up. So probably that's still somewhere in, in me, I suppose. It might not be easy to understand. And comparison with Germany, for example, showed that it was not as important in Germany as it was in Japan. And, and we do find this again in uh, a study where we compare Germany, the US and uh, Japan, again, social affiliations impact on subjective well-being. And there we use actually various measurements of subjective well-being is strongest in Japan, but I'm not showing that today because it would just be too much. So there seems to be something and it, it probably points to a specific importance of interdependence of how you, how you are positioned and how you belong and to other people um, in your society in the context of Japan and maybe also East Asia. I can't say because I haven't tested it yet, but I'd be very interested in finding, uh, like testing this empirically. Okay, I'll move to, I'm already gonna speed up, I know. Interdependent happiness is the last section. It's actually not that long, but so question is, are we measuring the right thing? And are we looking at the right, uh, maybe determinants when we, are we thinking about the right things when we try to improve well-being, let's say. So first of all, uh, interdependent happiness. I'm not really sure how, how um, familiar maybe people in the audience are with this concept, so I will explain a little bit. Maybe everybody's like, yeah, we know this, but uh, let me explain. So cultural psychologists have emphasized the importance of cultural postures of happiness. And while I'm a sociologist, this is of course psychological research. Um, here, I also put in the one of the sources, there's now, a, a, relatively large literature on this, but one of the first is the article by Yukiko Uchida and Kitayama. So um, this is of course not my, my own research. So in European or Western cultural, European or American or Western cultural context, each individual is seen as a separate or disjoint agent who acts on his or her own goals. And there's strong emphasis on the independence and the autonomy of the self. But in East Asian cultural context, the self is seen as interdependent, as connected to others. So this concept of social harmony is very important. Each individual is seen as embedded in social relationships and will act in attunement with the goals and desires of people around him or her. But there's still individual um, ideas about what you want to do, etc. But somehow it's all within the context of others. And these cultural construals of happiness is something that um, for example, Uchi and Kitayama point out is something we need to consider. So these different views of self are likely to result also in different ideas or constructs of what happiness is. So the highly individualistic Western view of the self is likely to also result in a certain view of what happiness is. So strong emphasis on personal and internal aspects of happiness. And we can clearly see this in the standard measures of well-being, subjective well-being which are all about my life and I feel, so it's very centered on the individual. And whereas the context-oriented East Asian view of the self is likely to result in an idea of happiness that also takes the social context into account. And so Hitoko and Uchida have developed a measurement tool to, to try and um, measure this. So interdependent happiness, and this is the scale, it's based on measuring social harmony and there's a, a, a strong 
focus on ordinariness as something that is um, something you want. You do not want to be sticking out. So this is why I called this talk the fear of not being ordinary. You want to, you're supposed to be ordinary, an ordinary life and quiescent. So that is kind of the um, what the goal is. So here measuring happiness is, uh, the, it's suggested to measure this interdependent happiness with the following nine items. So I believe that I and those around me are happy. So it's already an inclusion of others. And I feel that I'm being positively evaluated by others. I make significant others happy. And here, although it's quite average, I live a stable life. So this means that a good life is, doesn't have to be um, you're super rich and so much different from the others, but rather you are ordinary and everything is going peacefully. And that is what happiness is. So this is really what is uh, in, implied here. I don't have major concerns or anxieties. And I can do what I want without causing problems for others. So this is also not being a burden for others is important. Um, I believe that my life is just as happy as that of others around me. So you don't want to be happier, but maybe you also don't want to be less happy. So both, I think, is in here. Um, I believe I've achieved the same standard of living as those around me. And I generally believe that things are going well for me in its own way as they are for others around me. So it's very much about we should all be on the same level and then everybody can be happy. That's the, I think the idea behind this. And um, so of course the scale has been tested mainly by Hitoko uh, himself, but um, also some other researchers have started using it, um, but mainly it's been checked how it uh, correlates with other measures of happiness. And they haven't really, see, and it's mainly student samples, even it's also been tested in different cultural settings. So that's, it's, there's a lot of very interesting research about this, but there's not much, um, let's say, sociological research trying to include this somehow. So I tried to do this, not by myself, but uh, in several co um, research corporations. And one is uh, a research corporation with Susuzu Onuma and uh, two of his uh, students, Kasushige Sato and Shogo, Shogo Mizutori, they are all at uh, Hokkaido University, so my previous university, and we were able to carry out um, a survey, it's a random population sample from the city of Sapporo, so it's not nationwide, it's just Sapporo, but still, and the city of Sapporo wanted us to do this, so we, are, we were able to also use this data, and what we tested here is we uh, we did measure inter interdependent happiness, but we also included standard life satisfaction measures, so the, 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 the satisfaction with life scale. And then we just checked what are determinants of interdependent happiness and satisfaction with life, and how does that differ? And we included, uh, well, socio-demographics, but uh, right now we're writing this up, or we have written, and now we're revising for a psychological journal they're not interested in socio-demographics, but as a sociologist, I am, of course. So I also wanted to look at this, but we also include um, different uh, measures of social capital and included also social affiliation. Okay, I'm here also just showing the main findings. First of all, um, the ideas or our ideas to, maybe we can use, just use interdependent happiness as an alternative measure of, um, subjective well-being, so just not using Western items, but just use this one. Maybe it can also be used in, which of course can also be used or should be checked in other contexts, etc. But what we first of all could confirm is, I mean, first of all, interdependent happiness and uh, subjective well, uh, life satisfaction were very highly correlated, so they do measure the same thing and, and to a certain extent. Then looking at the determinants, also socio-demographic controls that we had in there, we just put it, pretty much put it in all the things that are generally associated with well-being. They all had the same relationship, so that's all uh, as expected, like more money, more happiness, et cetera, like these kinds of things. Uh, or being married is something that makes you more happy than people who are not married, et cetera. But we did found decisive differences when it comes to social capital. And this is also according to what we expected, but I think to a larger extent. So um, for interdependent happiness, so I here just write IH, um, a larger share of variance was predicted by the social capital resources overall. 
when looking at the items, it's not really surprising because it's all about how you are within your social relationships, right? And um, it is most strongly affected by social affiliation. So the possibility of feeling as part of society and as being um, recognized by society, let's say, and then followed by other things we uh, measured like interpersonal reliance or social support and community affiliation. So we, we had a lot of items there and I'm now revising, we have to reduce it all. Now, I'm up, time's up. So I'll try and come to a conclusion. <laughs> um, okay, I tried to split this into two larger conclusions and then open questions that I have. So first of all, understanding well-being in Japan, this is more like the first part of my, uh, what I, I talked about. So the social context, I think, well, it does help, of course, to understand mechanisms behind, for Japan, maybe lower levels of well-being than you would expect. Of course, there's also talk about it's a question of how people respond to questions, et cetera, but I think it's not only that. Um, we see so many studies that compare many, many countries, and I sometimes wonder, uh, these, they, of course, they are of value, but there's also some, a lot of points that we miss. So how can we balance this? Like, what, how, 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 how is that possible? So I think overall social context is important. In the case of Japan, it can explain a lot. We still have, have this I, relatively new idea of Japan as gap society, and there's actual effectiveness by this, unstable employment, reduction in income, but it also in translate into status anxiety and fears of not being able to keep up also in the parts of the population who aren't really affected by um, yeah, income reduction, et cetera. And at the same time, we have a very strong longing still for the so-called good old times, even in younger generations. I have done also qualitative research where I interview younger Japanese and it's still there that they have this view of a kind of standard life course of um, yeah, finishing your education, getting a stable job, and then you form a family and you, you buy a house and it's a very middle-class standard life course ideal. And um, at the same time, this means that if you don't manage to get this, especially if you are, um, I mean, if you go beyond this, that's probably fine. But if you are not able to secure that kind of middle-class standard of living, uh, then um, that's dangerous. Like you can be a burden to society and you will be, um, yeah, cause shame for your family also. So also in the context of the surrounding relationships. So not being Audrey, so dropping below middle-class level, I think is how we should think about this, is, is really a threat to achieving a good life, especially in this interdependent setting. And here I'm really happy for a lot of input um, if we have people in the audience who think like, no, this is completely wrong, or I don't know, other suggestions are very welcome. And then measurement and determinants of well-being. So on a broader level of what we are trying to do maybe as a society here, thinking about how can we measure things, et cetera. So I think results from different studies, first of all, imply that in an interdependent cultural context, it seems to be crucial for an individual psycholo psychological or subjective well-being, psychologists will probably kill me for that saying that, but to feel as a contributing and respected member of the social whole, it seems to be very important. And so maybe we should try and include this as a measure. And the specific importance of these aspects might be underestimated when relying on standard measures of well-being. And I think also in the context of if public policy is trying to do something to increase people's well-being, et cetera, then it's very important to understand what this, what this is in the actual context of the country that you're looking at. And I think, uh, for example, Japan, it, usually it's still, still the standard measures, the more Western measures are being used and maybe something is being missed there. Okay, last slide, open questions. So of course, they're common universal determinants of what well, subjective well-being, I'm very much for that, but I think there's also cultural differences in what constitutes well-being and how can we utilize both, especially when it comes to international comparisons. And of course, that's something we, I suppose, all want. I, I want international data, but how can, how can it be meaningful? And then further investigation of determinants of interdependent happiness and the impact of social affiliation. Well, that's my personal question, but I think in general, the interdependent happiness 
concept, like looking at this also from a sociological point of view, including more, um, I mean, now, now it's been a, very, a, a concept that has been used mainly by psychologists and there's not really much about um, what kind of, yeah, socially, the, the, interrelate, the relationship with sociodemographics, et cetera. So I now looked at this once in the concept, context of Japan, but I would really like more of this maybe in other societies, et cetera. And another question I have is how do we interpret happiness scores? Like, is it really always the case that higher scores are necessarily better? I mean, it really does depend on what kind of context people respond. And it can also be that people are super happy, but mainly because they kind of have adapted to or kind of given up on wanting more for themselves. So I don't know, I, that's also, that's maybe a question I didn't present so much here, but it's something I've been struggling with a little bit. And so to what extent do we need to take um, context, the social context into account? These are questions I struggle with and I'd be happy for comments and ideas of how to deal with them. Okay, thank you for your attention. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I can't, can only see Ming Zhang who's nice, nicely left his camera on. So I was talking to him the whole time. Uh, should I stop sharing my slides or what is the usual procedure? Maybe you can. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kalola. You can leave your slide there. Your slide there. Uh, probably uh, the audience would like to, to see uh, some of it again. Uh, this, yes. Okay, so we are now uh, can uh, taking questions from the audience. Uh, current, you can raise your hand or just. Uh, leave a, a, a question in the uh, Q&A uh, box. That will be all right. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I see two hands. Uh, the first one, uh, Daniela uh, and Dren and the name uh, Talita Grady. Grady? Okay, uh, I'd like you to, to uh, oh, more them. Okay, uh, Lillian, uh, John Bacon. Okay, so we have three hands. The first, uh, let uh, 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 Daniela, please. Can you? Uh, Q, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much for very, very good and inspiring presentation. I will be short. Uh, I will be at the end of the model. And uh, this idea, which is hypothetically excellent and perhaps in small groups might work sometimes, and uh, we might have uh, even empirical evidence, some kind of empirical evidence about the equality. If we all of us are happy, the society is happy and so on. Uh, I'm thinking from the perspective of uh, the research, what uh, complete the analysis of subjective well-being with measurement, with objective measurement. And I did myself analysis with cortisol, uh, and uh, from that perspective, I'm thinking uh, into that people have huge variation of this indicator. I don't say that this indicator is perfect, or but it is something what we work with, and biomarkers will uh, will be improving over time a lot. Uh, only from that perspective, I'm trying to say, they are suggesting the studies, what we did and this longitudinal study with this information, what is collected the following children since they were uh, individual, since they were 10 uh, until uh, nowadays when they are 65. Uh, and it's an uh, ongoing psychological project. Uh, like you mentioned, perhaps we do not have, uh, as we wish, socioeconomic variables into this. Uh, but uh, to make it short, uh, it is my concern about this. If the individual uh, individuals are different uh, in something what is subjective, uh, 
could the individual be shaped in such a way to come to change what perhaps the biology in us make us different. Uh, and of course, uh, related to this, it's uh, how uh, if you have plans to uh, in this wonderful theoretical frameworks, what you are working with, to add some uh, test uh, using uh, even biomarkers. Thanks a lot and good luck with your work. Thank you. Is it okay if I, can I respond immediately? Yeah, Ming just Chang? respond. Yes, yes please. Okay. Thank you, Daniela. This is a very um, interesting question for me because it's not something I have worked with at all. Well, I'm a sociologist, still too traditional maybe <laughs> to have been turning to biological indicators, but it would be very interesting to, um, to look into this more. I think for now I haven't, but um, I have also thought about the idea of like this cultural construal of happiness to what extent that could change. If I understand your question correctly, um, I mean, I, I interpret it a little bit now in the terms that I usually maybe think in or work in. Um, so if the culture, if somebody's placed in a cult different cultural setting, like me, for example, I've been now in Japan for over 10 years or so. And I also wonder how that does my, this, this kind of, biological setup or I mean it must be somehow for me I would think it should be shaped in somewhere by the context I grew up in but maybe it does change over time when you then suddenly change that context it would be interesting to to try and research that but of course it would be rather difficult maybe to find uh, individuals that fit that kind of category in general I find very interesting I will definitely look up what you are doing to find out more about this I must say it's not really something I have thought about yet Thank you. So it's a, it's a good pointer to something else to look at. Thank you so much. I hope that is some kind of uh, response to your wonderful comment. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, uh... Sorry, sorry uh, uh, Daniela, uh, we have other uh, hands raising. Could you hold on uh, for minutes? Let me turn to the other uh, uh, questions. Before we come back to you, is that all right? Okay, uh, Talita, uh, uh, greeting from South Africa. Hey, Talita, you can ask your question. Good morning, how are all of you? So nice to see you. I just want to make sure if I did understand correctly. In the Japanese culture, do they understand well-being or subjective well-being and happiness as a similar question? Uh, okay, Sim sorry, <laughs> happiness and subjective well-being as the similar question. Is that the question? Hedonic and eudaimonic. Um, if you ask them a question, uh, how satisfied are you with your life in general? Do they, do they then understand the same thing as um, have you experienced a happy mood today or did you smile today? Do they understand in the same way culturally? Mm -hmm. uh, good. That's a good question. Hard to answer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, from what I explained about the interdependent and um, maybe it's not what you mean, but here, here we have the problem of me being a sociologist and not a psychologist, I think, but um, so you are thinking, asking whether the question would I, I be understood in the same way by, can I just ask back, sorry, by a Japanese person and maybe a Australian or, I don't know, um, German so, person. Is that right? Yes, the, the interpretation of the question. We know that a lot of research has been done and they say that it is a really good measure because it is, uh, you get valid responses. But I think maybe I misunderstood that you said that they interpret those two questions very similar with the Japanese and that might be a cultural approach. Maybe I misunderstood. Um, I, well, I think personally, I think maybe a cultural psychologist probably will say something differently, but I would think um, it is understood in the same way, but maybe what goes on behind, like what, when you evaluate, like what is being taken into consideration might not be exactly the same. I think that is being indicated by this idea of when you evaluate your satisfaction with life, you also maybe consider 
what other people around you, how they are feeling. That's not a conscious proceed, it's not happening consciously, but I think it does play into this. So I think, um, but, uh, no, how can I say that? No, I, yeah, so I do believe that what is, like the, how this evaluation happens is probably a little different, but I don't also don't think that we can't compare because of that. Does that, that, uh, is that a response that is useful? I mean, I'm still struggling the, myself the, with this, so please go ahead. No, yeah. the, this is the answer I wanted is to see if cultural differences might influence the way you understand that question. So okay. thank yeah. you so much for the answer. And I must say, I'm an economist. So I don't understand the psychology behind things. Lot I learn as I go. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. I thought kind of placed you in just psychology corner. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, now we have a uh, another question in the uh, Q and A box. Uh, Carola, can you see it or? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'll just open. It. Uh, this is. Uh, Umihiko uh, Saito, Saito. Uh, Saito. Mm -hmm. uh, she asked about the positive and negative aspect of uh, uh, social capital, as well as uh, any uh, positive, negative uh, side of happiness. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me just read. Yeah. So pair, perhaps the Japanese care more about the negative side, avoiding to be sticking out rather than the positive uh -huh. side of being helped by some in case or helping someone could also be. Then my question is when you organize your surveys, are there any good ways in which we can me measure both positive and negative aspects in a balanced way? And in what ways can uh, we can learn the complex? <sighs> That's a really good question. And it's also something I wonder about because I also think that this Mm, can be rather restricting this idea of, I mean, maybe it's because I think about this from a too Western point of view still, but the idea of always having to consider also everybody else uh, when you evaluate your own happiness, that's, it's not happening like that, I think, but um, it's rather difficult. I think what I can say about this, I haven't done it personally yet, but I do know some research by colleagues, especially one colleague of mine, Tim Tiefenbach, who they looked at, um, for example, the something in Japan, you probably know it, but maybe the audience doesn't, neighborhood organizations is something that you are um, kind of forced to be a member of here. So some people are happy to be a member, but some people feel that it's kind of a social obligation that you're a member of the neighborhood organization. And that's kind of a form of social capital, I guess you could say, that can have, um, depending on the person, a positive or a negative effect. And they looked at this, how like, especially for uh, women uh, that, that it felt more of an ob obligation rather than something that you want to be a member of and you, you can profit from. But that's of course a bit different from this um, measurement of interdependent happiness. But um, yeah, it would be interesting to think about this. I mean, I also, when I whenever I read the scale, I also wonder about the, like not sticking out, is it, is it okay if you stick out in terms of you are above everybody else, is that okay? And just dropping below everybody else is what's not okay? That's, also, that's something I wonder about. It's a bit different from you ask, but um, I, I think your idea is more of the restrictiveness of this interdependence. Mm, yeah, I think these are, I will note this down because these are all important points to think about. I think there's still so much in this that could be looked at further. So I, I thank you very much for this, this comment. I really, yeah, I hope my response has been somewhat helpful or <laughs> goes into the direction that you thought about. Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, I think uh, this particular question about the avoiding uh, uh, the negative feelings, uh, means a lot for having happiness uh, in a certain uh, cultural context or uh, is quite intriguing, but well, it has been mentioned uh, quite several times frequently in the region, region but there's no uh, robust evidence uh, so far because uh, I don't know, but it's a, you know, a very interesting and uh, 
probably an exciting uh, thing to do uh, in the future. Uh, okay, uh, we have, uh, do we have more hands? No, uh, no hands. The uh, question, okay. Uh, no more question. And uh, anyone in the, uh, on the floor, you know, virtually on the floor, uh, can you know just go ahead and ask your question? Uh. Maybe whilst people are thinking of asking a question, I can also ask a question. I think the testing the scale in in mm -hmm. different settings would be very interesting. So I also would like to use this as an opportunity to invite anybody who would be interested. Mm -hmm in putting this interdependent happiness in a survey, if they have access to that kind of, um, I mean, getting data is expensive, et cetera. So in case anybody's interested in working on this together and uh, trying to test this in various contexts, uh, maybe also social affiliation, I'd be very, very interested in doing that. But I must mention again that I'm a sociologist, so I also want to see how that is connected to sociodemographic indicators, et cetera. Yes. The original uh, questionnaire, they have uh, nine items. Uh, it has nine items. It's very it's, long. I think yeah, they must yeah. think about a short yeah, version. A short because a version? Yeah, not yet. No. So that would be another no. point to think about, yeah. It's really yeah. impossible. You hardly ever have the opportunity to put that many items in a sociological survey That's with right. a large sample. So, yeah. Um, Recently, we, the, the survey I participated in, uh, you know, we this is this is many uh, uh, interesting topic to include it. So uh, all the you can have very small space for a specific topic. So it means that you are not able to to uh, you know include many uh, items. Uh, in a questionnaire, especially when uh, asking question on the field is, uh, is increasingly uh, difficult uh, yeah. uh, these days. So. But you can try it online. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, the one, one survey that we now did in Germany, the US and Japan, it's an online survey. It's a convenient yeah. sample. So that's mm, not mm -hmm. happy <laughs> with that. Okay. But, um, but it's it's not it's better than nothing, I would say. Sure, but yeah, in sure. case somebody has an idea, and I think we, the authors of this scale are probably also available to discuss, like how could we maybe go for a short version of mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I think it. I mean, they have tested it in also other countries, but it's mainly the test of um, the scale itself and how it um, correlates with other well-being measures, and not really including anything about what determines this. And I think that's the for me, that's the point that's really important to understand. What we find for now is that apparently the determinants aren't, it's not that different from the standard measures of well-being, which is also encouraging because it also means we can still use these for Japan or other like Asian context, context. But I mean, we do find some differences and these would also be interesting to look into further and maybe also check whether that's really something very Japanese or Asian. I'm not even sure if that's possible to say, uh, or if actually we find the same thing if we use this in a different cultural form or like Western, like European American, et cetera, context, maybe we find the same thing and that turns out it's not really, not really Japanese after all. <laughs> so that would also be interesting. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, any more questions? Okay. So I think I wish it uh, uh, end this uh, talk uh, here. I'd like to, to uh, ask all of you to uh, thank uh, Professor Carola Homorish uh, for her wonderful uh, talk. It's excellent uh, research results to share with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the possibility to be yeah. here today. Thanks so yeah. much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, keep please uh, love on uh, the other session to enjoy the, the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you all.